Okay, so we talked about central sensitization, and now we're going to talk about the effect of decreasing the descending inhibition at the spinal central synapse. Decreasing that descending inhibition really underlies a whole set of chronic pain disorders called central pain. And the one that we most commonly think about is fibromyalgia. It also appears to be a component of irritable bowel syndrome and multiple other disorders that are just not quite as common. So in central pain disorder, you get a heightened sensitivity to pain, but the most important thing is you had no initial injury. So with neuropathic pain and with inflammatory pain, it all had to start with an injury at some point. Central pain disorders are purely inside. They're a malfunction of that normal volume control that we use in pain processing. Because that volume control goes to all levels of our spinal cord, that volume control is affecting pain sensation in our foot, in our butt, in your shoulders, in the top of your head. It's controlling all of those. So if you mess up that descending inhibition, you're not just going to get an increase in pain sensitivity in your toe. You're going to get it everywhere. And so one of the things about central pain disorders is usually you see increased pain in multiple regions that don't apparently seem to have anything to do with each other. So if no injury is necessary to initiate this, what is really causing it? And so far, the biggest factor that we see is genetics. So people do have a genetic predisposition to having a weak descending pain inhibitory pathway. A lot of times that can often be triggered by a history of stress or abuse inside a family that has this genetic predisposition. Kids who had a lot of stress as children are often more likely to develop a chronic pain syndrome. And what we see is there's a high coincidence with anxiety and depression disorders. And that'll make a lot of sense when we look at what neurotransmitters are involved here. If you remember, anxiety and depression had several neurotransmitters involved. The most important seemed to be serotonin. And then we also had some norepinephrine and some dopamine involvement as well. So we'll take a look at the functioning of the serotonin and norepinephrine pathways in people with central pain disorders. So what are the changes to the pain processing pathways underlying fibromyalgia? We come directly to that brainstem pain modulatory path. So the brainstem regions there, remember those were neurons within the brainstem that sent projections down to the spinal cord and released either norepinephrine or serotonin, depending on which neuron it was. Those were going to be activated by opioids or cannabinoids. So in central pain disorders, what you see is a weak descending inhibitory pathway. So this pathway right here is weak. This guy is not working well. And we're going to see it's weak both in the serotonin and norepinephrine pathways. If you're not getting norepinephrine released and you're not getting enough serotonin released down at the central synapse, then you're going to not have inhibition of that transmission. Remember, that's a tonic inhibition. So there's small amounts of norepinephrine and serotonin being released down there at all times. If you take that away, now what would have just been a small pain signal now is crossing that synapse much more strongly, and now you're getting a stronger pain signal. So the exact reason that that brainstem pain modulatory pathway is weak is very complicated. And again, because this it has a high genetic component, they've identified multiple different genes that have to do with the noradrenergic pathways, have to do with serotonergic pathways, and have to do with opioidergic pathways. For example, in the brainstem of someone with fibromyalgia, there are fewer mu opioid receptors. And that becomes important because... We like to treat acute pain with new opioids, but if you don't have as many new opioid receptors, then opioids aren't going to really be able to be as effective here. So some of the things we saw was we saw that weak descending pain inhibitory pathway with that reduced norepinephrine and serotonin release, and we saw decreased opioid receptor function. And so all of those taken together are going to cause increased 
signaling through that central spinal synapse. And we're going to see it to where that's going to occur at all levels of the spinal cord, not just at one spot where you may have hurt yourself, like neuropathic pain. You're only going to have an increase in pain in that one, say you hurt your arm, you're only going to have neuropathic pain in the arm. But with fibromyalgia, it's going to be through the entire body. And it can take things that are normally not painful to anyone, just walking, sitting down. And now those signals are going through and are being translated as strong pain. So we consider central pain disorders to be central pain signaling and processing disorders. So they're a CNS processing problem. So we can look again just using this flowchart to try to make more sense of that. We had that genetic environmental problem that caused a dysfunction in our serotonin, norepinephrine, and opioid systems. When we're looking at that brainstem pain modulatory pathway specifically, we're going to have low activation of it, and we're going to have low serotonin release and low noradrenergic release at the spinal synapse. We're also seeing low expression of mu receptors in the brain. Because of that low noradrenergic and serotonergic signaling at the spinal synapse, we lose inhibition, that normal tonic inhibition, and we increase the spinal synapse's ability to signal pain over the whole body. So we have that increase in pain. We also see that because of the lowered expression of mu opioid receptors, that as well as decreasing activation of the pain inhibitory pathways, but because opioids also acted in the limbic region and in areas involved in emotional processing of pain, when you don't have as many opioid receptors, it actually increases the negative processing of pain. And when I talk about emotional, I don't mean like, oh God, it hurts, feel sorry for me. I mean like what your body is actually experiencing and, and how it's actually affecting you in terms of stress and in terms of your body and your brain's ability to respond to it. So if the big problems here are going to be norepinephrine and serotonin, then lucky for us, we have drugs that are exactly designed to increase norepinephrine and serotonin levels. And those are our SNRIs, duloxetine or Cymbalta and venlafaxine or Effexor. So those were our SNRI antidepressants. We also see that TCAs like amitriptyline increase serotonin and norepinephrine. There are some opioids, I said like methadone, that have some function that are also SNRI functions. And then a drug pregabalin or Lyrica, not completely understood how it works, but it does seem to help with fibromyalgia. And because you don't have as many opioid receptors, opioids are less effective for fibromyalgia than they would be for other types of pain. There isn't really a way right now to fix fibromyalgia because there's no way that we know of to actually recalibrate those norepinephrine and serotonin pathways. But we do know that these agents can reduce the pain, improve sleep, reduce depression, and improve quality of life with someone with fibromyalgia. And up here I asked what non-pain symptoms. And what I'm asking is if you have a screwed up serotonin, norepinephrine, and opioid pathway or systems, what are those going to do outside of pain? Well, serotonin, that's highly involved in GI control. Um, serotonin and norepinephrine are involved in mood, so anxiety and mood disorders. There's some involvement of serotonin in sleep. So when you look at other symptoms of fibromyalgia beyond that of pain, you're going to see things that really lead you back to this whole serotonin and norepinephrine and opioid dysfunction. So to summarize, we had talked about acute pain, and then we talked about types of chronic pain. And we talked about three types of chronic pain, which were pain that didn't have injury to begin with, like fibromyalgia, central pain conditions, or that had pain that remained after an injury had healed. We saw some of the drugs that are used for these. We saw in chronic neuropathic pain that we saw agents involved in ion channels, and we saw agents like NMDA antagonists that are useful if that neuropathic pain also then created central sensitization. With chronic inflammatory pain, we saw a lot of agents that were going to be anti-inflammatory. And I've added here a drug class called anti-CGRP agents. And we didn't talk about them specifically yet, but we're going to talk about them when we come to migraine. And you're going to see how they fit in with chronic inflammatory pain. 
And lastly, we talked about fibromyalgia and we saw it how it had issues with the serotonin norepinephrine levels and how SNRIs and TCAs were going to increase serotonin and norepinephrine signaling in the pain and in other pathways. And we also saw that for some reason, gabapentin helps. We also saw that these are harder to treat than acute pain. We see that opioids have less effectiveness for these kinds of pain than they do for acute pain. 